I want to say thank you to the elders and to Nick and to Buddy and the church as a whole for allowing me to come and share the message this morning. I do have a question this morning, though. How many here are glad to be a Christian? Amen. Amen. We have a second saying that we do in our congregation. We ask the question, has the Lord made a way for anyone this morning? All the time. All the time. If you have your Bibles, let's go to our scripture reading this morning. It's Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. We're going to be reading from verses... 43 to 48. So if you have your Bibles, I encourage you, please follow along. Luke chapter 8. I'm going to start in verse 43. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. Immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceive the power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Verse 48, And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace." go in peace. There was this man and he and his wife and his mother-in-law, they decided to go and take a vacation. They hadn't been on one for quite some time and so they decided we need to go away for a while. And the thought was what better place to go than to go to the Holy Lands. Let us go and see where Jesus walked, where his earthly ministry was and where he lived and where he died, where he rose again. And so they, they ventured on this journey and they went. But somewhere along the trip, the mother-in-law, she became ill. She became so ill that she passed away. Well, they went to a service, much like we have here, for individuals that take care of such things. And they went to this funeral service, this home, this director. And they asked for a couple of options. So they gave a couple of options. They said, well... If you want to take her home, then that cost will be about $150. They said, but if you, I'm sorry, $1,500. But they said, if you want to have the service here, here in the Holy Lands, here around Jerusalem, we'll only charge you $150. And the man spoke about it with his wife, and he thought for a while, and they came back. They said, well, we've made a decision. Uh, we have decided to take her home. And the funeral director, a little perplexed, said, well, why, why would you do that? The cost here is so much less. And the husband very intently looked at the funeral director and said, well, the last time someone was buried here, he rose three days later. I can't take that chance. <laughs> the man was not willing to take a risk. He was not willing to take a risk. Here we have in this passage... A woman who took a risk getting to Jesus. And I want us to really understand that if you go in your Bible, as we read already, it said she had an issue, a discharge of blood for 12 years. For 12 years. That's not only a, a great medical issue that we'd say, hey, that's very uncomfortable. But if you turn in your Bibles, you go to Leviticus chapter 15, starting in verse 19 through the end of the chapter you'll see some of the standards of what had to be held for a person in that condition. That classifies that individual as being unclean. They had procedures for that because it would only last for shorter periods of time. Anything she slept in, she sat on, a person she touched, they became what? They became, they became unclean. And so it limited her in her way of living. She couldn't participate in anything that happened at the temple. She couldn't be there to observe because what happens? You're going to be in close proximity to people. And if you touch them, they become unclean. So that limited her not only religiously, but in society and community. Because this community didn't want to be unclean because if she did touch someone as it was laid out for us, 
they became unclean. They had to go through their own ritual washings to become clean, be separated till the evening. So she is living in this perpetual state of being unclean, which means it limits her interaction in society, in culture, and in her religious community. Imagine the effect that would have on somebody. There was this Dr. Paul Brand. He was the one that pioneered the treatment for leprosy. He was in India, and he walked up to an individual, and he put his hand on this other man's shoulder. The man turned around, weeping and crying. The reason for that is because that man had leprosy, and no one had not touched him for a long time. Uh, this is how much human beings crave touch itself. So can you imagine, picture in your mind's eye, that this woman had lived so long without touch? Because anyone that had touched her was going to be unclean. So she is living in this state of being unclean. And being there, she hears about Jesus. Jesus has come. And Jairus, the synagogue leader, the Bible tells us, comes and says, I need you to heal my daughter. And Jesus responds, saying, okay, I will go with you. And as he does this, the Bible gives us this picture that there's this great crowd around him, because that's what happens around Jesus. There is this huge crowd that is around Jesus, so much so that the Bible tells us that they are pressing in around him. Now, I think sometimes we don't fully appreciate that word when it says they are pressing in around him. If you go earlier in the chapter, in verse 14, we hear, see, the parable of the sower. Go with me there. Luke chapter 8, verse 14. says, And for what fell among the thorns, for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. I, I want you to look at that word choked. In the Greek, that word is symponigo. That's what that word is in the Greek. It's the exact same word that is translated for us pressing. So it's not just that there's a large crowd. The picture here is that they, they are choking all around Jesus. That's how many people there are. So imagine to yourself that this woman, being unclean as she is for the past 12 years... She's working to make her way to Jesus. And let me ask you a question. Do you think she's coming in contact with anyone? Absolutely. Because the Bible gives us this picture that she did not even actually touch Jesus on his person. He, she touched the hem of his garment. Uh, that's how many folks were gathered around him. So I want to ask you a question. I would suggest to you, and I'd ask you this, does that mean she was brave? She had to have some courage to go and to venture out in the condition that she was in to go and seek out Jesus. She had to have the courage to say, you know what, I'm not going to stay stuck in my condition. I want to go and see Jesus. I'm not only going to go and see him, I want to touch him. Because prior to this, we are told that she had spent her finances on all these other physicians who did not find any help for her. Uh, they had no cure. So everyone else has failed. I'm going to Jesus. So she finds the courage to go to Jesus. First, we see her condition. And now we see her courage. The courage to go. Augustine put it this way. Augustine says that hope has two children, anger and courage. Anger at the condition we find ourselves in and courage to do something about it. We have one of two choices when we're stuck in our situation. I can be angry about it or I can find the courage to do something about it. And she found the courage to go and to do something about it. Her courage was to go and to seek out Jesus. So what was the conclusion for her? The conclusion was, was she got close enough to Jesus where she touched his garment, and the Bible says she was healed immediately. She felt that issue, that discharge of blood, immediately stopped. 
and she was healed. And Christ turns and he says, well, somebody has touched me. And then we have this comment by Peter, and Peter says, there's a huge crowd. How, how are you asking that question? And you kind of get the sense that Peter might be a, a little annoyed with that. Why are you asking this? Everybody's all around you. And Christ says, no, I felt power leave me. I felt power go. And all of the people, what they do at first, they denied it. No, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Which means that she denied it at first as well. Until finally, the Bible tells us she can no longer stay hidden. She said it was me. She said, I'm the one that touched you. And she testified to the fact that she was healed. She was healed by Jesus. And notice what he says. He says, her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. That's the conclusion of this account. I want us to notice something here that as Jesus is traveling along and this crowd gathers and she comes up to seek his help, you understand that he was not there on his way to see her. He was on his way because a synagogue leader came and said, I would like for you, please come heal my daughter. He was on his way because a person of a status came to him and said, I need you. And so he started to go. But yet she found the courage in her condition to go and seek him out. I got to thinking about that and I started thinking to myself, you know what? He was on his way to someone, to someplace important, but he made time for her. And she had to find the conviction and the courage to stop him on his way to something important to say, I need your help. How many times do we think to ourselves that God is too busy? I wonder if she thought to herself, well, Jesus, he's an important man. He's on his way to an appointment. I probably shouldn't bother him with this. And I wonder sometimes how many of us in the church, we find ourselves in circumstances and predicaments where we don't take it to God because God's got important things to do. I mean, look at what's going on in communities, in the country, in the world. God, God's a busy God. And sometimes we think, well, he's too busy for this. He's too busy for me. You see, we don't really verbalize it out loud to other folks because that doesn't sound too Christian. But we think about it. And what I want you to notice this morning, God's not too busy for you. God was not too busy for her. Jesus was not too busy to stop where he was going and pay attention to her. Not only to pay attention to her, but to heal her. I also want you to notice this crowd that is gathering around. Uh, there's a reason why I wanted to bring up that word, why it's the same word, because you have this crowd gathered around Jesus, choking around him like the thorns choke out the seed, the word of God. And I was looking at that, I said, wow, wow. That kind of means that those folks gathered around there in the crowd, they're kind of like thorns. Because they were that choking, those thorns gathered around Christ where she was trying to get to. And then I got to think about that a little bit more. Well, wait a minute. All of those thorns, all of those people, those are the people gathered around who? Some of you said it. You got to talk to me while I'm up here. They're gathered around Jesus. And I thought, okay, well, I want to think about that a little bit more. These folks who are gathered around Jesus, kind of like thorns in her way, they're gathered around. Sometimes we have thorns in the church. Sometimes our struggle in trying to get to Jesus are the people already gathered around him. And I thought, wow, we ought not to be that way. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 tells us, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as is the matter of some, but exhort one another so much the more you see the day approaching. My job is to come and to encourage you. Your job is to come and to encourage. We are to exhort one another. And guess what? It doesn't start Sunday morning. The Bible tells us as you see the day approaching. Now, I understand some folks want to fuss about, well, is that the day of the Lord when he comes again on the cloud, or is that when we come? I don't care. 
Bottom line is let us exhort one another. Let us encourage one another. Uh, let us not be the thorns that someone runs into, the prickliness when they come to service to worship our God. We should be that open door. But here's the thing. Although the crowd, the thorns were around, it didn't stop her. It didn't stop her from getting to who and where she needed to go. Because I want you to notice something here. The Bible says that power, Jesus says, power flowed out of me. There was no one else in the crowd that said power flowed out of me. That means she was there to see who. And Jesus is the one who healed her, not anybody else. So you may come to worship and you may see faces that are prickly to you. But they aren't the ones here to heal you. The only one that's here to heal you that can heal you is Christ himself. So I come because of my Lord. And that is why I come. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus and nobody else. She had her condition, but yet she had the courage. The courage to come and find Jesus. I want us to keep going and, and looking at this. We notice that she comes and she comes trembling and she falls down before him. I'm in verse 47 now. And declared in the presence of all people that she is the one that touched him. She says, I'm the one that touched him. This is after he asked who touched me and everybody else denies it. And so finally, she comes forward and she says, I am the one that has done it. I, I want you to notice that Christ was not going to keep her healing hidden. He, he did not heal her to keep her hidden away. And sometimes we do. We, we come to Jesus, and Jesus solves the issue that I have in the moment, in the season, in the circumstance of my life, but because of what so-and-so may think. Because imagine this. Remember, she's unclean. She's in a crowd. Why in the world is she going to speak up? Because she just rubbed elbows with all these folks. And what did she do to them? She made them unclean. So, of course, she's going to be quiet. And we get that way with our sins sometimes. Christ comes along and he heals what's going on in my life. But it's of such a large circumstance to me that I'm going to keep it over here. And it reminds me of that song... This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a, I'm going to let it shine. The Bible tells us, so let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. There, there is no longer that Christ says, you know what, I'm going to take you out of the dark and I'm going to bring you into the light. You don't get to stay hidden. You see, you don't have to stay hidden. When Christ comes and he heals you and he restores what is lost... You don't have to stay remaining in the shadows. He wants to bring you out into the light. I love where Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God that leads to salvation. He says, I'm not ashamed, and neither do you need to be. Don't live in the dark if Christ has already healed you. We don't have to live trapped in what other people may think. I want you to notice, why, why is that true? Because we come down into verse 48, and he said to her, Daughter. Oh, stop and think about that for a moment. He calls her daughter. If you go to the account where Christ goes to Zacchaeus' home, and by the end of that account, he says he is also a son of Abraham. He brings him back in a covenant relationship and identifies who he is in his place. He comes here and he calls her, Jesus says, daughter. You know, I find that interesting because when I was born, the only ones that named me were my parents. No one else named me. Now, I had someone ask me this morning, do you like to be called Ray or Raymond? I said, well, my name is Raymond. Why? Because that's the name my parents gave me. Christ calls her daughter. So she can be called anything else, but Christ calls her daughter. Okay. You see, the enemy likes to call us by everything but our name. And that's what happens. You go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. The Bible describes the enemy as the accuser of the brethren. 
And he wants to call you by every sin that you've committed. He wants to call you. You're a liar. You're a traitor. You're an adulterer. You're a drunkard. You're this and you're that. And he calls you by your sin. But Christ calls you by your salvation. He, he calls you because you are a child of God. If you go in your Bibles, Galatians chapter 3 and verse... See, we know verse 27, for all those who are baptized in Christ, we have put on Christ. But if you go one verse above that, all those who are God are by faith in Christ Jesus are sons of God. You see, I am a son of God, which means you don't get to name me. Now, you may call me names, but you don't get to name me. The only one that gets to name me is my father. And so he is the only one that gets to name her. See, they could have shouted all kinds of things about her. Unclean woman, this or that. But what Christ calls her is daughter. And when he does that, he establishes what? Her identity. He says, I am establishing who you are. You are a child of God. You are a daughter of the Most High King. And we forget that sometimes when the world wants to call us all kinds of names. They want to call us by our past. They want to call us by our mistakes. But Christ says, no, you're my son and you're my daughter. I named you. I get to call you. And who I call you, I call you redeemed. I call you reconciled. I call you renewed. I call you a chosen people. I call you a royal priesthood. I call you more than a conqueror. This is who I call you. You don't let no one else name you because your father already did. He says, I have called you. He saw his daughter. Daughter. Then he goes on to say, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Go in peace. He gets to leave her in a state completely different than when she came, and she gets to go in peace. You know, when I grew up in the church, I always heard the comment, uh, leave your cares and your burdens at the door. The cares of this world, just put them out of your mind and leave them at the door. And when you're young, maybe you can do that. Because your biggest problem at that point is, I can't bring my toys inside. But as you get older... And you go and you experience life and circumstances and mistakes and consequences. And you have it piled up upon your shoulders. Let me ask you something. Is it very easy to leave it outside the door? No, No, thank you. Someone's honest in this crowd. It is not easy to leave it at the door. Because you carry it with you. So what I would suggest to you is walk in with it. Bring it inside. You go in your Bibles to John chapter 16. Go in your Bibles, John chapter 16, verse 33. He says, this is the peace I leave with you. It says, it's my peace. In the world, you will have trouble. He says, but I have overcome the world. You see, that, that's the key right there. That's the peace that we get to have. You bring it in with you, and you leave it at the foot of the cross, and then you walk out without it. That's what needs to happen. See, I don't have to carry it with me out this door. I may bring it in, but whether you leave this morning with it, that's up to you. She came with her ailment to Jesus, but guess what? He healed it, and when she departed Jesus, she had it no more. You may walk into this building with the cares and troubles of this life, with everything that piles upon our shoulders, but you don't have to leave with it. You see, because here's the thing. We talked about it a little bit earlier. She came with an uncleanliness that she carried with her, and everyone that she came in contact with was unclean, and we can't miss that. You may have a sin that you're holding on to this morning that nobody knows about, and you think you're not making people unclean, but you are. It's making others unclean. And what God wants you to do is bring it in and leave it at the foot of the cross. And let Christ heal you from that so that you can walk out, guess what, in peace. A peace that passes all understanding. Well, how does that happen? Because it's not my peace. It's not peace that I've come up with. And he gives us what it is. He says it's my peace. Because you will have trouble in this world. But the peace that I have is that our God overcame the world. He says, I have overcome the world. 
And that's exactly what he has done. You see, I don't know what you're struggling with this morning. I don't know the trials and tribulations that you may have gone through. I don't know what you walked through the doors with this morning, but I know you don't have to leave with it. You don't have to leave. This lady, this woman described for us, she's identified as having a condition of being unclean. She finds the courage to come to Christ, and her conclusion is she leaves healed and in peace. And I wonder sometimes how many of us walk into church buildings all across the country and we leave just as broken as we came in because we are too ashamed to come to Christ. And all he's saying is come. Come. Uh, notice he did not berate her. He didn't go through a litany of questions. What, what did you try? What did you do? Because the Bible tells us that she had tried other cures. Are you tired of trying other cures yet? Are, are you tired of trying to seek an answer outside of God and outside of his word and you're surprised when they keep failing? All right, now. Come on now. Because we do that. You see, it doesn't tell us what she did, but I imagine she went to the experts and the experimental to try and get rid of her ailment. And we do the same thing. We, we face issues in our life and we'll go to the experts and then we'll experiment, but you just need to come to Jesus. I like that. So you need to have a come to Jesus moment. Yeah. And do like she did and you get to leave healed. I, I encourage you this morning. If you've come in here with the weight of the world. Leave it at the foot of the cross. Christ is beckoning you. If you have not been buried with him in baptism and given your life to Christ. To be cleansed and to be renewed. He's calling you to do that. Now, you may be here having done that, but you have wandered away from the Lord. And here's the interesting thing. You can be sitting here every Sunday and have wandered away from the Lord. And if you have done that, you may hide in a crowd, but Christ sees you. And guess what? He loves you. And he's still beckoning you to come home. Come home. You have a congregation of the Lord's people here that will pray with you, encourage you, uplift you, exhort you. And you have a God standing ready to forgive you as you repent and reorient your life towards Jesus Christ. If we can help you in any way or pray for you for anything, we desire to do so. If you would come forward as together we stand and together we sing. And we